Rolling Dice and Taking Names is sponsored by The Broken Token, creator of high-quality gaming accessories and storage solutions. Visit them online at thebrokentoken.com. Marty, it's our anniversary month, so it's going to take a lot to drag me away from you. There's nothing that a hundred men or more could ever do. Just move on to the intro. You're so unromantic. In this episode, the guys review West of Africa, Ascension Dreamscape, plus Flying Squirrels. And Marty, like Kilimanjaro, rises like Olympus above the Serengeti. Oh. Hello and welcome back to Rolling Dice and Taking Names. This is episode 90, Africa, and I'm Tony. And this is Marty. This one, Marty, is going to have not one, but two reviews in it. What's wrong with us? I don't know. It's like we never used to do a lot of reviews, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're doing all these. I don't know whether people like them or not, but hey, you know, we're going to do a couple of them. And also, we got a Flying Squirrel segment that we hadn't done in a couple episodes, so I'm looking forward to doing that too. But first, I must again congratulate you on a well chosen song for the title it's very appropriate being that one of the reviews we're going to do is west of africa Mm -hmm. and as probably a lot of people know um, africa was from toto who i think is one of the more unsung groups because when everybody thinks of toto they think of like africa and rosanna as more of a poppy thing but they were actually a really good rock group yes they were and i went back and i was listening to and watching that video and i just didn't realize how bad the videos were back then. You, you don't realize these things. And it was, uh, oh, it's been a while since I had seen that one. But yeah, Africa, I was what I was really hoping to do, other than match, of course, the air, various things that we're covering tonight is also try to put an earworm in your head. Because sometimes <laughs> that one, I think, will do that for you. And if there's a Toto song, that that's going to be it. But if people haven't listened to a lot of Toto, they have one of the most unsung guitarist of any rock band I knew. Steve Lukather is an incredible guitarist. And I don't know if he gets a lot of credit that he deserves. But do you remember the story that was going around about the, their drummer when he died in the early 90s? I don't. I hardly remember anything about Toto other than the album that had the, if I remember correctly, this album had those rings. That's about it. Their drummer, Jeff Picaro, uh, died in the early 90s. And the reports was he was outside in his garden and was spraying pesticides on his plants, had allergic reaction and died. Okay. I don't remember this. Yeah. It it was like, man, that's kind of freaky. So I went and looked, went back and looked up that story. Well, come to find out when they released the coroner's report later on, it was like, actually he was overdosing on cocaine and had a heart attack. So I, I don't know where you go from. He died from pesticides to cocaine overdose, unless it was just their, you know, manager like, okay, we don't want this guy to be known for dying because of ODing. Yeah. Well, he could have very well been trying to kill the various pests in his yard by having them OD and thus through secondhand application, he did. You, you, we don't know what was going on there other than he's unfortunately not with us anymore. That is a stretch. Well, you never do know. Were you there? No, you weren't there. I was not there. We just know what they said. He OD. How he got to that point, we don't know. Okay, well, fine. Regardless, if you haven't listened to a lot of Toto, go check out their Greatest Hits album. It's, it's really good stuff. Yeah, it is. But I tell you what, let's do something even better. Let's go check out a review of a game that I love playing on the iOS, Ascension Dreamscape. <laughs> If you've been following Portal on Twitter, you know that Ignacy's been talking about 51st State. We were very fortunate to get early copy. I've played this game twice, and wow, is this game good. If people know, I'm a big fan of Imperial Settlers, and Imperial Settlers came from 51st State, so going back to playing this game, I thought, oh, this is going to feel very familiar to me. Well, it does feel very familiar, but it's different enough too. The pre-order is still going on, but it's going to end any time now. It will be available in mass market around time of origins. So if you're interested, go check out 51st State and we'll be doing a full review in an upcoming episode. Just recently, I got a physical copy of Ascension, their latest expansion, Ascension Dreamscape. Now, I love playing Ascension on the iOS. Thank you, Dan Patrice, for bringing this to me. I'll, I'll 
one day I will pay you back for this. But anyway, so we received a physical copy of Ascension Dreamscape and I got to play this with Dan and I said, oh, this is so good, Marty. I got to introduce this to you. So what is Dreamscape? So it is the ninth expansion to the line of Ascension, which is a deck building game. Now I know nobody lives under a rock and they all know that, yeah, Ascension is a deck building game, but I didn't realize there were nine expansions, Marty. Yeah. And who makes this game? Stoneblade makes this game. Thank you. The expansion includes a new mechanic called Insight that is collected by the players as cards with the key term Dreamscape appear in the middle row. Or I'm sorry, Dreamborn. I'm sorry. I, I, Dreamscape, Dreamborn, all, all those dream terms. Anyway, this new mechanic is used to buy cards in which players have an, an individual Dreamscape deck. And these cards have very special powers to them. So just like previous ascensions, you'll have cards in the middle that you can buy, but in this game, you have a new type of resource called insight. You're battling monsters, you're buying cards with honor. And you know what? It's all about the honor at the end of the game because the player with the most honor between the cards and what they did in battling the monsters is the winner. So you would say that honor is kind of like victory points. You could say that. And, okay. and I would agree with you completely about that. So for me, Ascension Dreamscape, I, I really enjoy, like I said, the game. I, this is probably one of my favorite expansions to it. Now, as far as an expansion goes, Marty, it's not really an expansion. You can play it by itself and or you can add all the other expansion standalone games to this and make a mega Ascension, which would blow my mind. But either way, this is probably one of my favorite expansions to Ascension. The rest of them I have on the iOS and this is the physical. So, so I enjoy it. I, I really like it and I'm glad I've added it to my collection. I have don't have a copy of the physical game and I've only played it uh, when it first came out at uh, Gen Con. For me, if I was going to play Ascension, I actually won the physical game. I'm not so sure I would start with this one because the new mechanic that they've added definitely feels it's kind of like an expansion, but I'll explain more as we get into it. So for me, I might pick up one of the other Ascension games before I would get into this one, but I'll explain why later. Setup is like all the other Ascension games. Each player is going to be given 10 cards for their starting deck. You will have eight apprentice and two militia. And what are these cards? Well, they're your cards that can buy or battle. The militia can battle, the Ascension can buy. And you, those include, um, you will get to draw five cards. But anyway, I'm getting myself all confused here. You're battling for a number of points or honor points at the beginning of the game. And this is determined by the number of players. So it's 30 points per player. So this game can play up to four players. So that would be four times 30 is 120. A little quick math there for us. And you are battling for that number of points. You're not battling against one another. The other difference in this Ascension, which I've always, uh, other Ascension games, which I've already covered, is that players are dealt five cards from the Dream Deck. Players look at these cards and they get to pick three of those five cards, and the two that they don't pick, they put back, and the Dream Deck gets shaf uh, shuffled and it becomes the Dreamscape Deck on the board. Once players have done that, then the Ascension Deck. You will put down six cards in the center of the row, like normal Ascension games, and you are ready to go. So everybody's got a starting deck of 10 cards there. They've picked three dream cards or dreamscape cards for them to have that are not part of their normal deck. They have to buy them later. Let's begin to play. And you know, the gameplay is pretty much like any of the previous Ascension games. It's a deck building game in that you're going to have your uh, hand of cards. You're going to basically play them all as effectively as you can. Uh, that maybe the order that you play them is going to be very important, obviously. But again, the goal of the game is to collect honor. And you can do that by uh, defeating monsters, which give you honor. Or you're going to buy other cards from the middle of the table that you can add to your deck in order to make it better. And maybe come up with a strategy that you want to go to, to to maybe get a certain type of construct that you can do combos with and everything. And as soon as you buy a card from the middle, it's immediately replaced from a card from the deck. And if the card that is turned over has the word Dreamborn on it, then each each player is going to receive an insight token, and when a player buys that card, they actually get an additional insight token. And so this is the part that's kind of different. And on a player's turn, at any time they may spend insight in order to purchase one of those cards that uh, Tony had just talked about, that uh, from the starting hand of five and you chose three, you can buy one of those 
add it to your deck, which is going to do something cool for you later on. So like Marty was saying, the dream cards that you have that you can purchase at any time during your turn have the ability. They're like the normal Ascension deck cards. They have heroes and they have constructs and heroes are, you know, when you play your hand, the hero becomes active or a construct comes out on the table and stays there. And it's, uh, round to round it is constantly there but in the dream cards when you play a vision card it has an immediate effect that will either make it become discarded after you use it or it may stay out on the table it depends on what it says so that is the big difference between ascension dreamscape and normal ascension from that standpoint is that these vision cards are a new type of mechanic that you have to figure out how you want to use now, one of the key things about Dreamscape is you never can add to your Dreamscape unless there is a card in the center that allows you to do it when you purchase it and you put it in your deck and you get to use it later, or there may be some other effect. So that's how you can add cards to your Dreamscape. So that is the big difference, Marty. Yeah, because after that, the play continues as normal like in previous Ascension games, and basically each person is going to play their cards uh, draw from the draw deck once the, all there there's no draw deck you shuffle your discards and, and can continue from there each person takes their, their turn you keep going till all the honor is claimed and then you total all the collected honor plus the honor that's actually on the purchase cards that you got over the course of the game and whoever has the highest is the winner one thing marty we had some feedback on our guild from uh, the gentleman i mentioned previously and he got upset that you basically were throwing your cards on the table because that's really chaotic because how you're supposed to some cards will make you say discard a card from your hand but if you've played your cards on the table then it's no longer in your hand and that's kind of pushing it i didn't really care i don't know about you well i mean when we were playing it did it bother you i just like i'm just going to put them all out here and i'm going to resolve them in any way that i want if it says discard a card from my hand well my hand's just sitting on the table right now that's all because after i use the card i would put it in the discard pile yeah it's just as long as you keep that um mechanic going so i didn't it didn't nothing like that bothers me I and you know what and it shouldn't so this person just needs to get over it. Well, I can understand that, but you know, <laughs> some, some people, you know, it just they're just like, oh no, you got to hold those in there because it's not in your hand anymore. A card laid is a card played. Ah, oh, get over it. It's okay. Did you just make that up? Because that's pretty good. No, I've heard that many times. And oh, playing. card laid is a card played. I, I like that. Well, thank you. All right. So there are some pros I really have uh, with this game. First. Tony, did you realize that I was at Gen Con the year they introduced this game in 2010? Mm, no. mm. Yeah, it was at the very back of the convention hall. I remember going back there and it was like, hey, a uh, you know, we like our card games, right? Mm -hmm. And this sounded really kind of cool. The Ascension and the, uh, the I like the deck building games at the time. And I sat down and tried this game out. And the first thing that stuck out to me was the whole honor thing. Because, you know, I'm so used to having, when you have cards with heroes and their monsters, you usually think you're going to be damaging other people but that's not the way it is with ascension you're just trying to destroy monsters which will give you honor The really and you know more about this than i do it seems like the really only way i saw it to interact with other players is there might be cards that cause other people to destroy their constructs mm -hmm. and and maybe there's some other ways but there's not a lot of player uh, interactivity so i did kind of like that and i remember seeing that in 2010 and i thought it was a really good game it's funny you know what kind of kept me away from buying it yeah. was the art because the art is an acquired taste i think mm -hmm. and even though i enjoyed the game it was one of those that eh, it's, like, eh, it's okay maybe i'll pick it up later but i just never did but you know it is really cool uh this many years later to see them continuing add new elements and new expansions to the game so i think they've really done a good job with this game and for me my pro is probably one of the things that you said it's an acquired day but for dreamscape i really do like the art in this series a lot more i think instead of the dark foreboding that they have had in previous series you know kind of very i don't want to say negative but it just to me it's kind of like is uh, it gave me the creeps i felt this was a little bit more airy like a dream i think they did a great job in in giving you that feel in the cards for this series that hey it's not that nasty world that you remember from ascension this is kind of like you know the the guys going out and they're they're this is part of their visions and all i, I really do and i love the vision um idea of the 
system of being able to having the immediate plays. That's really neat for me. And insight, I, I enjoy the insight part of the um, game. I like having that second resource for me. That's a big plus for the game. And, you know, um, they're getting ready to come out with another expansion later this year. Justin Gary announced it all over there with Mr. Patrice on his recent episode where he's interviewing him. So I'm really looking forward to see what other mechanic, like you were saying, you know, they're, they're, they're still going with this game, still bringing this game out. Now, for a con, though, I will say this about the game. Those little insight tokens roll. The, they're little eggies. They were rolling all over the table. They were rolling into my pile. They could have been rolling over there. I don't, oh, why did you pick round tokens? That just that floors me. I don't understand that. Yeah, and that was actually, it got annoying after a while because I remember one time I thought, well, I thought I had some extra tokens in order to buy stuff, but I thought I didn't. And I looked under a piece of paper or something and they had rolled Yeah, <laughs> under the piece of paper. It's like, daggum, I would have bought that. And I know that is silly, but why in the world, like you said, why would you get use tokens that are basically like egg shaped that if it's not on a flat surface, they're just going to start rolling away? I know. That's, that was just funny to me that they did that. But hey, yeah, you're right. I can sub it out. I like the color. The color's kind of cool. But, you know, other than that. You just use our old glass beads that we use for all our card games. That will still work. Yeah, if I can find them. I'm sure they're stuck away in a Lord of the Rings box somewhere. But anyway, the font, I'm an old man. It's a little small on cards, people. I know, I know you got to get it in there, yada, 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 whatever. But the font was kind of one of those um, Ignasi fonts. They were down there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're going to call it now. Yeah, the Ignacy <laughs> font. The Ignacy font, which now for, for, from here on out will be known as a small a font. A small font, yes. So that I'm not getting any younger out there, and I know I'm whining and I'm old and yada, 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 whatever. But that's fine. The fonts were a little small. Kill the freaking flavor text. I'm sorry. I don't read it anyway, so I can read the regular font. So that's just me. You? Here's the thing. I haven't played a lot of Ascension. I have bought it on the iOS. I remember both you and I got it and we played a few games here and there, but I haven't really played a lot of, a lot of the physical game at all. And for me, I can tell that the dream mechanic is an add on. It feels to me like this probably wasn't part of the base game and it feels like just something that they put on there to, to give a new mechanic to it. So for me, as a guy who doesn't play a lot of Ascension, it just felt a little out of place. It was like, okay, now here's this extra resource that I may do something with, with these cards over here that may do other stuff. So it just kind of, it just didn't sit well with me because it felt like an add-on. Now, again, if you are a longtime player of Ascension, you probably love this because it is something fresh, something new, something that you're not used to doing. But just coming as, as from the guy who hasn't played a lot, I could just tell it was a, an add-on. What's your final thoughts on this? So I don't own any Ascension. And to be honest with you, if I was to going to go buy a copy of it, I probably would not start with Dreamscape just because that mechanic, I can tell, is somewhat of an add-on. I would almost rather just go buy the base set. And I know that uh, last year, I think they came out with a special edition or something like that. I would probably rather start there and kind of build from there. And if I played the base set for a while and then kind of got used to those mechanics and how it worked, and then add a dreamscape, I would appreciate it more. So for me, I probably will not buy a copy to put on my shelf. Instead, I would just go buy a base set, and for right now, I'll just play your copy. It works for me. It's about time you, I can give back to your uh, library. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. Now, for me, like I said, this is the quick deck builder for me. I really enjoy this. I think Donna would probably enjoy that and she would understand the insight part of it. I like that added mechanic. I know, I understand what you're saying, Marty. I really do about it's an add on, but someone who's never played Ascension to them is probably just going to be another way to get cards. I think the dreamscape of your own, you are having cards that you are protecting that the other player cannot beat you to. You can, if you get dealt the right amount of the five, you could probably set up a pretty good combo right there. So that's a pretty neat thing. So I really like the dreamscape 
insight mechanic that's been added to the game. I think that's great. Yes, the game can be swingy at times. And yes, you may not be able to get the cards in the center. When Marty and I were playing with two other people, we got we got stymied. I've never seen the center row be full of monsters. And we all started out with the deck building. You remember that, Marty? Uh, I do, yes. And it was just like, how in the world? And, and it took us a while to get the engine going. How are we going to do it? So we ended up with a lot of uh, garbage in our hands to try to get rid of the monsters to be able to cull it down. And that's a big part of it. But for me, you know, Ascension Dreamscape, I'm happy that I have it. I'm glad it's on my shelf. I don't see any reason to add anything to it. And it will definitely be if someone says, hey, you want to play a quick deck builder? Star Realms, I'm sorry, you're on the shelf. Ascension Dreamscape has taken your place. And now it's time for Flying Squirrels. Short discussions on topics that have our attention for now. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. That's right. It's time for another one of our favorite segments, Flying Squirrels. In this segment, each of us are going to talk about any array of topics that we want to, but we're only limited to two minutes to talk. And once that two minutes is up, you're going to hear this sound and it's time to move on to the next topic and kicking us off with the first squirrel tonight is Tony. I had the opportunity to travel for work again and I was down in the Tampa area and last two years ago, I was down in the St. Pete and went to a game store. So I said, I'm going to go to another game store here in the Tampa area. And I was happy to go to Armada Games in North Tampa. Armada Games was hosting a meetup for board gaming. Marty, I walked in there. I wandered around just a little bit. And then suddenly, as I walked by a table, a guy said, hey, you want to play a game? I said, well, sure. That's why I'm here. And I was immediately um, brought into the game. I, I got there late and they had enough games going on where you could jump in anytime. And you know, one of the neatest things about this was that the part of the meetup is when you sign your name, you get a slice of pizza and a Coke. I was like, oh, this is bonus right here, man. Very nice store, lots of tables. The people were great. I got to play Zombie Side season three. Um, you know, I was the old man, Terry, and I really enjoyed that. Um, Amanda, Andrew, Richard, and um, Adam, uh, yeah, I think that's his name. Adam were all part of it. We were able to escape, get out of there. Um, I saw a bunch of other people playing. We had um, Guild Ball going on, and um, Armada Games is one of the first people to start playing the Guild Ball. He has a whole bunch of tournaments. He was one of those that he saw it and brought it in. He loves Guild Ball and is a strong supporter, and they have a huge, huge following down there, as well as a lot of his stuff. He has his own line of tokens or specialized tokens that you can buy there in the store. He has special ones for Guild Ball. He provides discounts on some of his board games. It's a great store, War Machine, you name it. He has a lot of it. Uh, if you are in the Tampa area, north of Tampa, up near I-77 in Fowler, I highly recommend that you get over to Amarta Games where everybody knows your game. Oh, dude, that was pretty. That was nice. Was that their slogan or did you just make that up? Uh, it's actually on his business card, dude. Oh, but that's, that's a great slogan. Great slogan. So everybody knows I'm really into game accessories. And one is getting ready to come out on Kickstarter, if it's not out already, called the Game Canopy from Level 3B. You might have seen this on Rodney Smith's Watch It Play channel. It is a carrying case for games. And they were nice enough to send Tony and I a sample of this to see what it looks like in Tony. This thing is gorgeous. It's this huge uh, zippered bag with uh, foam all, all around the outside of it with uh, with this nice uh, material on the outside that's, that's water resistant. It's strong. It'll hold, gosh, five, six, seven games. It has uh, pockets in the front and the back. It's got these D-rings with, uh, and they're going to provide straps that you can attach to the D-ring so that you can sling it over your shoulder or over your back uh, to carry it with. Uh, it's designed such that uh, the front of the uh, bag folds down forward so you can easily pull games out of the bag. Uh, I cannot believe that somebody hasn't come out with one of these before. Now, people come out with bags, Tony. You know, we have our battle foam bags that we have for miniatures. But I haven't seen somebody come out with a bag for the sole purpose of carrying board games. Why would they not have done that, Marty? 
Gee, thanks, Mr. Interjection. I don't know why they would not have done that, but now somebody is. And they and they just announced today they're going to have a smaller version of the bag called the Vanguard, uh, which is basically going to hold maybe about three or four games. They have probably some of the larger games in there showing they're holding three, made out of the same thing, very durable, just a little bit cheaper. So here's the, here's the thing. This is a pricey bag. It's going to uh, retail at $159 for the large bag, which I know is a lot. But keep an eye on the Kickstarter. There's going to be an early bird where it's cheaper. And it's, and the uh, overall price of the bag will also be cheaper on the Kickstarter. If there's something that you're interested in, go check them out. Again, it's level 3B, and the name of the product is Game Canopy. Well, I appreciate that because, you know, Game game Canopy, you got to keep those games. Some of those games are priceless, so you really need to protect those games over there. And, you know, I cannot wait to borrow that when we go to – or wait a minute, you'll probably be using it at Origins, won't you? Uh, we'll share it at Origins. Okay, well, okay very good then. Well, we uh, occasionally get requests to talk about Kickstarters. And, you know, if they're coming a little late, uh, Marty and I, we, we, it's not fair for us to say, hey, this is a great game, go back at da 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 well, we received one of those recently. It's called Cavern Tavern. We didn't get a chance to do any reviews or anything like this, but I went out and I watched a lot of their teaser videos, Marty. And, you know, they've produced a couple games locally. They're uh, uh, not in the United States, but this is going to be their international release. Now, why am I telling you guys this? Because it has some really neat mechanics that I liked when I watched all the teaser videos and everything about keeping a dwarf who's the owner of a tavern happy. And I like how they use the dice mechanics. I thought it was kind of neat and how you had to fill the orders real quickly. Now, am I going to go out and back it? I'm going to be watching this one. I've, you know, I've pretty well kind of, I don't know, but it's, I, th I thought it was neat enough that it brought my attention, interest, curiosity meter up a little bit just how they're going to be doing it, it kind of reminded me of lords of vegas and king's forge but they have a way to mitigate luck with rolling dice and here at rolling dice and taking names i'm like you know if this is a pretty good game that, that, that fits right in because where else would you take some names but where everybody knows your name but at a tavern it sounds like is this going to be like root beer tapper yeah, you're trying to fill orders and do chores. That's what I f also thought. So, you know, it's one of these things I don't want to, you know, get all giddy about and hyped up over it. It's just, it was just interesting for some odd reason. Speaking of uh, Kickstarters, I know one Kickstarter that uh, Tony and I got into years ago was that first Kickstarter from Gameling Games. They're the makers of the Tiny Epic series. And the first game that they came out with was Tiny Epic Kingdoms. They just released their second edition, and we got a copy of it. And Tony, I have been playing this game with uh, my coworkers from work. I've been doing these team building sessions mm -hmm. two days a week during lunch, and I taught them this game, and it has been a hit. The differences between the first edition and the second edition are the rule books cleaned up a little bit. There's some graphic enhancements. And during the war phase, if somebody loses, they have the opportunity to retreat. In the first edition, you just lost your meeple. But now if you have an open space you can move to, you can retreat, which, are, which I kind of like. So other than that, the game plays the same way, and it's that 4X feel but on a smaller scale, they inter they also introduced an expansion to it called Heroes Call that introduces heroes where there's a new meeple that's a little bit bigger than the others. And this guy can have special abilities that you can level up over time. And then they can be retired. Once you max them out, they're retired. They gain you victory points at the end of the game. Plus, the expansion has new locations, a new resource, war towers that can be built and destroyed. So they've really done a lot with this little game. But the funny thing, Tony, was, you know, this game is supposed to be a 4X style game, but made to be played in under an hour and with simple rules. So the people that I taught this game to at work aren't, uh, don't play a lot of games. They aren't gamers, probably. They were totally blown away by this game and they kept telling me man this is the most complex game i've ever played which i thought was kind of funny because actually no this is a very simple version of a much more complex style of game so i get this all in your perspective so for us it's like oh cool a simple forex game and for them it's like wow this is one of the toughest games i think i've ever played before. you need to drop starcraft on them one time man just do that. Just go boom, drop that on the table and say, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So instead of calling this flying squirrels, maybe we should have called this flying kickstarters because I guess it's that time. I mean, April, we're ready for spring. Spring flowers brings all that good stuff and all the kickstarters are coming out. Well, 
So part of that is I had an epic Tony fail in teaching a game at our local game club here recently. I told Marty, you're playing this game that we put on Periscope called Saltlands. It's coming out for Kickstarter in uh, April 26-ish time frame. It's post-apocalyptic. The world's been wiped out. There's nothing but sand. And it's a co-op sort of kind of game. And I was trying to explain it to Marty. And I did an epic fail of trying to teach him this game. So much so that I just said, okay, game's over. We're done. <laughs> he did. He started just picking pieces up off the table. And me and the other guy was like, what are you doing? It's like, yeah, we're done. We're done. It's like, but we didn't get to play. It's like, I totally screwed this up. This game's a lot better than what I'm teaching it. You teaching you to play. Uh, oh, I mean, it was, it's so simple in the mechanics. And I couldn't even, I was screwing. I mean, it's real simple. You've got a person and you're trying to collect hints to the rumors as to where the escape is to where paradise may lead however you want to do it and you're trying to navigate through the sands avoiding bandits but you can't avoid them all because you need to collect things from them so you've got to go beat them up or recruit them to your team so that you can then gain additional characters now i will say this the wind act um, mechanic of this game was really cool. I liked how it controlled how your cart flew. Um, what I didn't like about this was that there was the chance that if you get killed two times, you know, you get mortally wounded and then killed, you're out of the game. That sucked. I would house rule that completely out. So guys, around April 26th, take a look for Saltlands. Also, you're probably going to see me try to put throw together a video because y'all really need to see me over on our YouTube channel. Out of the blue this week, Privateer Press has announced they're coming out with a whole new rule set for War Machine and Hordes. And most people are calling it Mark III. The, the current edition is called Mark II. Whether that keeps that name or not, I'm not sure. We were People were stunned. I mean, that was the buzz this week. Tony and I played a lot of War Machine early on. This is going to be coming out the end of June. They have really changed some of the core mechanics, Tony. I don't know if you've seen some of these. They've, they've, they're boosting up the point allocation, but the big two big things that they're changing. The way that uh, War Machine and the Horde side works is totally different. In War Machine, the Warcaster can allocate focus uh, to the Jacks, What's going to happen is at the beginning of each turn, if the war jack is within your control area, he automatically gets a focus. And that was kind of neat because it's like, okay, you automatically get to focus to start with. But Tony, I remember for you, I think it's going to be a bigger deal. You play a lot of hordes. You remember how fury worked, how the uh, your beast could generate fury for you to use and spend. But remember when they died? That means it was harder for you to generate fury. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, got that. Well, get this. Warlocks will now get one fury from every destroyed beast. So if they lose something, they're still going to be able to collect fury from it. And that was to balance the whole war machines uh, uh, thing that happened. Because at the beginning of the game, it seemed like the hordes were more powerful, but got less powerful over time. And the war machine went the other way. So they're balancing that out. The other big thing that people are just going gaga over, Tony, pre-measuring is now allowed. Ooh, that's interesting. Do you like that or dislike that? Uh, you fin finish it out and I'll have an opinion right when you're done with your two minutes here. Oh, okay. Well, so pre-measuring it, for what that means, uh, for War Machine before, you couldn't measure. You just say, I'm going to attack and you measure and hope that you're right, you know, for a distance that you need. There's also going to be better battle boxes. There's going to be maps to come with it and other stuff. Uh, they're just really retweaking the system. But the really cool thing is all the existing models work. All you got to do is buy new faction cards and you're ready to go. And the core rules will be free on PDF. All right. Core rules is good. But you know what, Marty? I don't care. I sold my set. I'm done with War Machine. Okay. Here we go, people. I'm on the nut. I'm not on the soapbox. I'm on the nut. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, I'm ranting here. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Never mind. Go ahead. So anyway, okay, yeah, that didn't sound right, but get over no, it. No, it did not. Get over Keep it. Keep on moving. But anyway, so you've you've said that you are going to bust people down for making or offering your stuff out there. You're going to put them on this free rider um, board of shame. And now you've gone out and talking to a gentleman recently, he is like, you've got to be kidding me. 
I cannot offer, oh yeah, the models are going to work, but you're going to release a whole new starter set. What about all the old starter sets I have? What about the tons of rule books that I have in my shop right now? I can't offer that at a discount. And yet you're lambasting me because you're coming out with new rules. How am I going to drive up the players? I can't believe you did that. So I was talking to this gentleman and he was, he was not happy about this, Marty. Well, they might, I don't know with the retailers, maybe they'll have a buyback program for any existing product that they have in the store. I don't know how that works. Well, I hope they don't sell it at a deep discount or they'll be put on the free riders list. Well, did you know that's, that's actually come to fruition now? There's some stores online that's basically had to cut their deep discount to comply. And now they've come out and said that their sales have tanked because of it. Uh, he said that same thing. He was on the list and you know what else he said? He said that because the fantasy flight stuff, he had to pick online or store. He picked store and, and he is not happy because cool stuff can do both because they're big enough. And he did a lot of sales online on any of his back ordered stuff. Now he can't do that. So he is just pulling his hair out over these pricing policies, and he is a brick and mortar store. He is trying to do the right thing and trying to drive business in there. And yet he said both these policies, they, they hurt him. Wow. So uh, I guess, well, we were worried about the smaller online retailer being hurt. I guess you have an example of it right there. That's exactly right. But maybe in a year or so, we'll go back, revisit it with him and see what he has to say. It's all over, Bullwinkle. Hey guys, I don't know if you know this, but the Broken Token not only makes great inserts, but they also offer you the ability to pick up some of their accessories. You can pick up not only token trays that help organize various tokens, but metal coins that are hand buffed to a finish. They can really pimp out your games. And also, if you're lucky enough, you can pick up some very special meeples that you can add to your Lords of Waterdeep. Those are some of my favorites. So not only go check out the Broken Token for the inserts, but also go check them out for or their various gaming components. That's thebrokentoken.com. We were very fortunate to get an early copy of the game West of Africa. This is a game that's been published by ADC Blackfire Entertainment. Designer is Martin Schlegel. Plays two to five players for 60 to 90 minutes. Right now you can get this on a pre-order at Fun Again Games. It's supposed to come out late spring, early summer, but they had some copies that say, hey, how about if you send you one, you check it out. So I was excited to try it and we got it to the table and, and got to play it. So let's talk about it and review it. In this game in West of Africa, which is, we'll just say is the Canary Islands because that's what it is. Players are going to cultivate goods. It's supposed to take place at a, a time in history where they uh, move out to the uh, Canary Islands and, and change it over into places where you're, they're, they're cultivating uh, like agriculture. And they're trying to sell the goods and become profitable. And over the course of the game, you're trying to become the al How do you pronounce that, Tony? al Alcalde. al Alcalde. Alcalde. Alcalde, which from this point on, we'll just say mayor because that's what it whoa, means. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, we can't just say it's the mayor when I wrote Alcalde in the notes. You're just, oh, you're just going to mess me up. Yeah, but see, in parentheses in the rule book, it says mayor. So I'm going with mayor. Okay. <laughs> so anyway you could become the mayor of each one of these canary islands you can build settlements how this works is it's a action selection through a set, set of cards each player has their own deck of cards that contains four actions that they can pick from and plus there's one card for each island on the board and then there's also a single card with a negative four value each player is going to select cards from their deck in order to perform actions on their turns for the sole purpose of trying to guess what tony gain victory points because you guess what the person with the most victory points was going to win this game i, I am shocked you not see it on my face i'm shocked <laughs> <laughs> well it's a euro game yeah so. what do you expect honor points victory points uh how many ways can we call you know a victory point something what's another synonym for victory point here we got it's probably a ton of them yeah this game is really more for me over multiple plays. When I first played this game, I thought, okay, there's a certain sequence of actions that you would have to perform every game that didn't change from game to game. But I've come to find out that that isn't necessarily true because when I played a game with more players, uh, with like four players, there was a lot more player act interaction. And what happens was sometimes your best laid plans 
or thwarted by somebody else. So you always kind of had to have a plan B in your back pocket and you always couldn't stick to the exact same plan. I understand that and I, I can respect that opinion. For me, this game was a pretty good game. I mean, I enjoyed playing it. Um, it's it's not a great game. It's not a good game. It's right there in between for me. I enjoy the mechanics of this game. I enjoy the card draw. I enjoy that. But I worry about it being too prescriptive. And I'll talk about what I mean by that a little bit later as you continue to play. I don't disagree with Marnie that, you know, there's got to have different plans, but the, the same thing will happen over and over and over. And that worries me a little bit. Yeah. Well, like I said, we'll talk about that at the end. So let's just talk about a little bit how this game works. Setup is really straightforward. Tony, you put the game board in the middle of the table. I'm, I mean, that's the first wow. thing you do. What, where? I, yeah, I, I, know. I know. What's so funny is if they hadn't put it there, people would be probably wondering where it should go. <laughs> Actually say, put the game board in the middle of the table. And then each player is going to receive his color and tokens and a deck of cards. Players are going to place one of their cubes on the zero victory point track. Uh, two workers are going to go. There's a boat uh, along with the islands. There's a boat on the left side of the board and a boat on the right. Two workers are going to go on the one on the left. One's going to go on the right. Uh, there's going to be another cube placed on the 15 gold spot. So there's two tracks on the board, one for tracking gold, one for fa tracking victory points. And then the other tokens are going to place beside of the board or in front of the player. Uh, and then you got your deck of cards and that's it. So setup is really quick and straightforward. Right. And I, I appreciate about that about that for the game. Now, the game is simple as far as steps that you have to do. There is only three, and even I, I can keep track of that. You only need three of them. The first action is you take the cards from your deck that you want to use to perform actions. And so all the players at one time, they are going to select the cards to play during their the action phase. Guess what? The action phase is the next step. You're, the cards that you've done, you're going to play them, and they are going to have actions for you to take care of. So that will say, hey, you know, what actions are you going to take on the islands or move workers? And we'll go into the actions in a lot more detail. All right. Now, one of the thing is that each card in the deck has an assigned value in the corners. And these cards kind of help determine who goes first. These values, I'm sorry, these values go first. Now, players can pick up to four cards for free. The fifth card that they can select, so they can pick anywhere from no cards, I guess, all the way up to five, but that fifth. It's actually it one card. One, you have to start with okay, at least one. One yes. card. Thank, thank you, Mr. Announcer. So um, you got to pick one and you go up to five. The fifth card is going to cost you four gold. So you've got to have it in order to do it. So keep that in mind. If players tie in their values, then the player with the most gold will get to go first. So you sum all these up and guess what? You determine who, what the play order, the person with the lowest number gets to go first. And then some of the actions that you can do, like one of the most basic actions is, remember I told you had those workers on your boats? One of those is just moving your workers. And you can move up to four spaces, and you can do that in any combination you want, meaning you can move one worker four spaces. And a space is moving from a boat to an island, and then from island to adjacent island. You can do that up to four times, or you can move two guys, two spaces, or you, know, you can split that up however you want. It, it uh, doesn't really matter. The thing is, though, uh, some of these actions require a, a island card to go with it to perform it. This is one of the ones that you don't. You just say, hey, I'm going to move some workers, and I'm off and running. One of the actions it does is the cultivate grow crops. You've got to have an island card to associate it because when you play the cultivate grow crops card, it has to be to an island in which there are spots that have that capability. So these islands have different crops that can grow. Some of them can grow corn, some can grow grapes, and there's a varying amounts that can grow there. Now you have up to eight that you can do four corn, two grapes and two. What's the other one, Marty? Oh, I can't remember. Is it, is it wheat? It's wheat. Is it, is it four wheat? Did I get, get them all? It doesn't matter. There's four, two and two. All right. So anyway, so now the same island card can be used. So wait a minute. You said I can only select up to five cards. Well, one, or maybe it's sugar. I wonder if it's indigo. Wait, that's Puerto Rico. That's Puerto Rico. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, the, that's right. The same island card, if you have actions that need island cards, those island cards can be used for this for multiple actions. So you don't have to say, hey, this island card goes with this action and, and this island card goes with this action. You, you don't need to do that. That is one of the neat things about this. Now, when you Put those crops down on the field it's going to cost you three gold to cultivate a crop unless those workers marty's just talked about are on that island if those workers are on that island then they will reduce the cost of planting a crop by one gold so if you've got two workers there then it's only going to cost you one gold for each crop you plant now after you use those workers they get back on the boat they got to be put wherever, whichever boat you want to put them on, but they've got to be put back on the boat. And at the end of the round, those plants that are cultivated will actually move to a warehouse. And each island has a warehouse place where all of the cultivated crops go for all the different players. So another action that you can take on your turn is if you got crops in a warehouse on an island, then you can sell them for the prices in that uh, warehouse. Now, the islands have different varying prices that you can sell crops at going anywhere from six up to 12. And so if you plant stuff on the on the island that's actually furthest to the west on the board, those are cheaper, and the warehouses furthest on the right will sell for more. So you select the island card you want to sell at, you select the sell, and then you actually sell as many of those items as you want to for the prices indicated. And the max amount of gold that you can have is going to be a uh, 45. One of the things you got to keep in mind of the islands on the far east over there don't have any crop circles. They only have the warehouses. So how are you going to get them there? You ask, well, that is an excellent question. You got a ship and you can move that ship up to three spaces or sea links on the board and you can pick up crops in one warehouse and ship them over to these other more expensive warehouses. And that's something you need to consider as you can do it. Now, sea links. We, this game is 60 to 90 minutes. Our first game took five hours. <laughs> well, that's kind of an exaggeration. <laughs> uh, yes, it is a kind of an exaggeration, but oh, Marty, that was one of the funniest discussions I've ever had in a game. This is one of these things, people, where you, you really need to think about your rules and how you word your rules. See links. You would never think it would be a problem. Yeah, so what is that question actually came up when moving workers? Mm -hmm. Does a movement of a worker count from island to island? Does that count as one movement? Or once you get off the boat to an island, one of the people that was playing with this said, I kind of interpret the rules saying that I can move to any island that I want on the board. That started, it, Tony, it really was a 20-minute discussion, right? It, it was. It was long. It was hilarious. Because we were trying to figure out how the rule book meant it because it wasn't very clear and the examples they give – uh, couldn't be interpreted one way or another. Since this game is not out in a lot of different places, there wasn't a fact that we could go ask. So actually, after a lot of analyzation, we decided, you know what? It's it's island to island. That had to be the way that makes sense. And then as we played the game, we all kind of convinced ourselves that must be the way. But that was really funny. So what, what was funny was the guy who brought up the issue with the game and, and thought it should be one certain way eventually said, no. You guys are right. We'll leave it the other way. So we basically wasted 20 minutes. Yeah. And, and the way the rule read, it said you can move from island to island by those connected by sea links. Well, yes. well, the whole thing is connected by a sea link was his argument that that it's not really indicated. Did the harbors break them up in the sea links or was the sea link the whole chain and the harbors were just spinoffs of it? it oh, it, it was great. I loved it. Speaking of the harbors, though, when you do move the ship, there is one interesting mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get to a harbor and there's already a boat there, you actually push it to another island. And that's one of those things you might have to plan for. You might expect that your boat's going to be at a certain island when you're ready to move, but, but somebody could come in and push you out of that island and actually move you to another one. So that's another one of those mechanics, mechanics you got to kind of look at. One last action that you can do is you can form a settlement. One thing I didn't mention on the setup is that you're actually going to put little settlement tokens on the board. There's going to be, depending on the number of players, it's either going to be four or six per round. And what you can do is you can become the mayor of that. Uh, you could become a mayor of an island. And once you become a mayor, which we'll talk about in a second, you can actually put a settlement on the board. Now, this is a core mechanic of the game because this is going to be one way you get victory points. So you have to be the mayor. You play the settlement card 
and the island that you want to build a settlement at, and then you build as many settlements as you want. And they range anywhere from six to 12 gold. So obviously you're gonna to wanna to build on the six spots first, and then the more expensive spots will be left at the end of the game. So for everyone you build, you immediately get three victory points. A card that deserves as much love that does not have an action to it is the minus four. You know, I talked about summing up these totals in the upper corners of the card. Well, one of these cards, it has no action other than up in the corner, it says minus four. So when you're adding up to determine who has the lowest score, this minus four card obviously subtracts from your total. So it can help reduce your value and maybe let you be able to um, get to go before someone else by playing this card. Now, these cards are very important in later rounds in the game, in my opinion. But once you use this card in your hand, then that card at the end of the round gets passed to the player to your left. So, you know, that's the important thing. To you don't get to hold on to it. No, mm -mm. you get to share it with your neighbor. So keep that in mind. So this minus four card, no action, but it helps reduce the sum of your total cards played during that time. Okay, well, so once everybody has played all their cards, then we have some little cleanup phase um, at the end. So the most important thing is probably who is mayor. But before we get to that, the two players with the most amount of gold will each get one victory point apiece. All the crops that were out in the fields will actually move to the warehouse. And now you actually determine who's going to be the mayor of the island. You go to each island and whoever has the most influence at that island is going to get the little mayor token. The uh, amount of influence is based on goods or people or ships that are there. For every good that you have in that warehouse, you get a point. For every worker that you have there, you get two. And if you got a ship there, you have two. You add all those up. Whoever has the most influence there gets the mayor token. That's resolved at every single island. And then you get one victory point for every mayor token that you have. Now, one thing I do need to talk about that we really haven't mentioned a lot is there are a lot of situations here where you can end up at a tie. You can end up in a tie for who's going to get to go first when you reveal uh, your total cards at the beginning of the action round. You could have a tie in who has the most influence. That's one of the cool mechanics of this is the gold track. The first person that lands on a spot on the gold track gets the top spot. And if somebody else comes there, they move underneath them. So basically, when you go to tiebreakers, whoever that was there first actually breaks that tie. And that's actually an important part of the mechanic. But anyway, at the end of that round, when you're done, you re refill any settlements that were uh, uh, taken during that round. Everybody takes their cards and then you begin again. Rinse and repeat. Now, when does the game end? with somebody gets 25 victory points and or all 20 settlements are used. So the settlements aren't an endless pile. There's only 20 of them. 25 victory points happens or the 20 settlements run, down, run out, everybody gets one more last turn and that's it. So whoever has the most victory points after that final round, da da da, you're the winner. A few things that I really appreciate about this game. One, it is quick to set up. I can have this game set up in five minutes and for a Euro game, that's somewhat unusual. So I really appreciate that aspect. And at the end, the cleanup is just the same. I give everybody a bag. They put all their color tokens, all their cards in it. I have another bag for the mayor tokens and the settlements. Put the board in the box. We're done. Set up, clean up. Very, very straightforward. People who are very familiar with games, this game was very easy to pick up because you just explain those actions and then that's pretty much it. I love simultaneous action selection games as opposed to everybody kind of taking their turn. Instead, everybody decides at once. Everybody then tells what their total is and you determine your round order from that. As I mentioned, the tie-breaking mechanic is a strong part of this game. And it's one that really comes into play when you make decisions because you may decide looking at the gold track where you are and realize, okay, right now I'm highest of anybody. So I have all tiebreakers. And that is important because you may decide, you know what? I'm not going to spend as much gold this time so I can stay high up on the gold track and possibly have to, uh, if there's like a mayor ship that you really, really want so you can build settlements later on, you might want to make sure that you stay higher than everybody else in the gold to break any potential ties. That gold track is genius, Marty. 
I love that gold track mechanic that they have on there. And the fact that it's used to break all ties, it's not this way for one thing and this way. It's real simple. I love that. Hey, if you are the first one to get to the 14 gold or not first one there, but if you spend gold and you're down to 14 and someone comes along where well, you were first, by gosh, you were first in line to the bank. So that person goes underneath you. Therefore, you're. it's easy. It's easy to see. It helps with the flow of the game. I like that. There's always a way to do it. And it is a very key part that part of this game. I like how they brought that into the game. I agree with you. Fast to play. This game, once you know the cards, it's bam, bam, bam. Everybody picks at one time. As long as that one person doesn't take forever um, to lay down the cards, it's very fast. I like how you determine who gets to play first. I love the values of the cards and how well they got those sum values up there that certain actions are going to cost more than others. That's very important and you need to really plan for that because as Marty said, you can get screwed up by that because when you think you were going to go plant on an island and you just happen to see that someone who's playing in front of you is um, cultivating on that island and they pick the same island as you and they take all the spots, there's nothing you can do. You are royally. But anyway, so any cons? <laughs> Actually, that is exactly what happened to me last night. I planned to go to an island plan a bunch of stuff and the guy before me took every single spot so yes it does happen so when it comes to cons there is a lot of math involved and because of that the math and the decisions can lead to some ap during the action selection that's actually the slowest part of the game because you can just see people working well if i take this and i put these two together my sum's going to be this and if I sell first and I get this gold or I can move the ship over here, can make more gold, sell that, try to buy. You could, it's just everybody's like doing human calculator stuff. It, it almost, it, we almost need scratch paper for people to start writing down numbers and sums and everything. Because many times we would do our selection and realize, uh-oh, I added wrong. I don't have enough gold to build a settlement. So because that aspect, there can be a little bit of AP during the action selection mechanic, especially if somebody's slower than the others then everybody may be waiting on that one person and they're just taking a little bit too much time. If you don't like player interference in Euro games, then you may not appreciate this because it doesn't sound like there's a lot of interference, but boy, there is. When they're playing with four players, you are stepping over each other all the time. Somebody may take settlements from you that you had wanted to build. That happened to me in the first game we played, Tony. Remember when mm -hmm. one of the guys built like four settlements? When it got to my turn, they were all gone. So I didn't get to grab any victory points. I gave the example of somebody planting stuff before I got there. There is more player interaction in this game than what you think may be on the surface. So if you're not into that, that might bother you. And that's especially true for four and five player games. I did play a three player version of this and it wasn't as, as brutal in that way. The game ends quicker than what you expect. You think, okay, I'm going to build up a little engine. I'm going to plant some stuff. I'm going to sell some stuff. As soon as people start putting down settlements, we're talking three points per. It only gets, takes to 25 in order to uh, end the game. So if somebody builds three, four settlements early, you realize, oh my goodness, the game is more than halfway over. And then it just ramps up a lot quicker than what you expect it to. You, you really need to play the game a few times to realize, okay, this is not a long, drawn-out game. This game is going to end quicker than what I thought got to kind of have uh, all that in mind so if any of those sounds like deterrence to you maybe you're not a big fan of it to me it didn't bother me except maybe some of the ap and mathy stuff because our last game that we played just took a little bit of time especially toward those last few rounds yeah and i can definitely see that i mean uh, i can see the ap is one of the concerns for me for this game as well as people sit there and they try to say okay if i and I, this happened in our game marty i was sitting there trying to calculate and you're welcome yeah, I had to buy those four settlements to even give myself a chance at a win. I appreciate you forgiving me on that. But my, my concern is that I know all euros and you and I got in a big debate over email about this. That you're all euros are this way. You got to have money. The only way to get money is to buy crops. You got to be the mayor in order to buy the settlements. Uh, my concern is that it will be very scriptive on what you've got to do so that the, you will know what other players are having to do. If you're low on the money track, you know, he's going to be harvesting. So if you can get out of their rhythm, then maybe you will succeed. I'm a little concerned that if someone can figure, you know, is really good at jumping into there or breaking the rhythm, 
you can also really screw people up. Now there's plenty of places to place a um, harvest. I agree. You just, but if you're unlucky, like you were the other night, then that can give you a sour taste in your mouth about this game because suddenly, once again, you don't have money to go do something and you have to harvest in order to be able to sell. I mean, I don't harvest, cultivate. You have to be able to do that. So to me, it becomes very scriptive type of game. I want to play it a lot more, but that is a nagging concern of mine. And we can probably revisit and see if that goes away. Yeah, but like you said, are, are Euros that way? Is it there some sort of mechanism that... Uh, it, everything's based on victory points, right? There's some way to get victory points and everybody has to do that in order to generate those victory points. So that's where I was, you and I kind of going back and forth. It's like, we really should have waited and record this <laughs> our discussion, but that's what I was trying to come from. I can pick any Euro game and say, well, okay, there's a lot of Euro games where there's planting food and selling food and getting gold to get other stuff. And that's kind of what this is. Uh, but think about when we talk about fields of Arl. I mean, it's the exact same thing, but I never felt like you were in my way all the time, you know? No, that's that's true. I will give you this because I talk, thought about it a little bit later. To me, I would consider this a medium weight game. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a heavy game because there's not that many ways to generate victory points. Right. Let's let's compare that to, say, like Fields of Yarrow or Trajan, where there's multiple paths to create victory points. And the whole big decision is like, which path do I want to go? Here, the quickest way to victory points is settlements granted yes you can get a point if you have the most gold at the end of a round or points for mayors which one of the guys last night was doing that he was trying to collect as many mayor tokens as possible and get three or four points per round but in the end the settlements is kind of what pushed somebody over the edge i i, I see what you're saying but i think the player in act interactivity is what messes you up because you're right tony in the fact that if i'm low on gold people know I have to cultivate and they may try to block me. They may use that minus four card to get ahead of me. I need to have a plan B in action. And as you stated before, I can put one cultivate card with two islands. I may have to waste one of my card slots so I can have multiple choices when it comes to my turn to have two islands to cultivate on and not rely on just being able to do it on one. Yeah, I, I understand that. I completely understand that. I'm not, I, let's, let's talk about it in our final reviews. You go first. I love my easy to teach one to one and a half hour euros. That's why last year I loved the game Vikings. I thought it was fun. It kind of uh, not as easy to set up as this one plays in an hour. I think this is where this game is going to fall for me. While I too was concerned, Tony, with the thing after the first game, I felt, uh oh, it's going to be samey. When I taught my family the game, I did kind of kind of take a prescriptive method of like cultivate, get a lot of money, put a lot of settlements, win the game. But last night when I took it to the game group and I played with a lot of other guys that played a lot of other Euros, that was shut down pretty quick. I realized my plan A wasn't going to work and I, I didn't do very well at all. So I had to kind of convert and go to plan B. So the player interaction is going to keep you on your toes. You'll always need to have a contingency plan in place as such because it does fill that nice little niche for me of that quick Euro. It will stay on my shelf. And I think it's one of those that I'm going to pull off and play many times during the year. I would add this game to my collection if it wasn't the nagging concern about how the game could become very repetitive and how to win. I don't want to say it's like Blood Rage Loki strategy, but I'm concerned that there may be some type of mathematical computation by some brainiac and they say, oh, this is all you've got to do to win this game. Not because I'm smart and can see it. It's just, it's, it's a nagging, gnawing type of feeling I have. But I'm going to let those that are way smarter than me tell me whether or not I'm wrong or right after they have a whole bunch of plays and they're pros at these Euro games. I'm not a pro. I'm nowhere near a pro at, at playing Euros. I usually end up losing, but I have fun. So for this game, I had a blast playing this game. I would put this game on my shelf after I hear back saying, no, oh, there's multiple ways to do this. I look forward to, you know, I love the card interaction and all that. Now, would I be able to play this with my wife and friends? No, there's no way. This becomes a four hour 4X game because of the AP. There's no freaking way that this could happen. Don't think from Marty and I talking about that, that there's not a lot to think about here. There is a ton of stuff that you've got to plan for. You've really got to think 
And this happened to Marty in the first game we played. He didn't think far enough out ahead to prepare himself for a couple rounds in the future. And I was a blind hog and found an acorn and saw it come and just hit me. <laughs> a blind hog finding an acorn. Yeah, that's a common expression. Blind squirrel. No, it's blind hog. Google. A hog? A hog. Are you serious? A, why would a hog find okay, acorns? For, Squirrels find acorns. For this, uh, hogs find acorns too. But okay, for this show, it's a blind squirrel finding an acorn. All right. But seriously, guys, if you like Euros, it's a deep thinky game. There's more between the covers here. Definitely give it. It's easy to teach. You really need to consider this game and, and definitely get an opportunity to play it. Um, I'm glad Marty has it. This way I can borrow it and just see how long it does take when I teach it. Well, it's one of those things. I'm just going to refer to something you said. Is this going to be like Blood Rage where it's the Loki strategy? We now have played enough Blood Rage to where that's not a concern anymore. Right. Once people know the game Blood Rage, we haven't had that Loki strategy work at all because now we nip it in the bud. So I wonder if with enough plays where somebody feels like I know how to win this game, if the rest of us can shut it down. We'll just find out with more plays. I do think this is a game that I could teach a couple of our buddies, Tony, that we get together and play those quick euros with. So I can't wait to see what they think of it. If you're interested in this game, Fun Again Games is taking pre-orders for this right now. It's supposed to come out late spring, early summer. So if you want to, pre-order at funagaingames.com. Well, that's it. Episode 90 in the books, baby. Two reviews, some squirrels flying at you, a few blind squirrels out there too. We're done here, except we we got some other business we need to take care of. So Marty, what's on your plate over there? Well, I actually just want to give a shout out to the Cardboard Jungle, who in a previous episode talked about the podcast that they enjoy and listen to. And they mentioned us. And I just want to say Thank you uh, for mentioning us and that they listened to us. However, the caveat was Anthony Ricano, who's over on that show, said the reason why he likes us is because we're older than him and it makes him feel young. Hey, I'm good with that. And I'm glad Anthony's back. Seriously, he took a, a hiatus. I'm glad he's back at, behind the mic. That's good for him. It, it, does, it does his soul good to get those evil spirits exercised a little bit. Because, you know, the devil did come down to North Carolina and record a show with us. Anthony was possessed? Devil? You know, anyway, I, I tried to tie it together and you messed me up, but that's okay. I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take blame for that. Also, I would like to thank everybody for our pod pledge. We met our goal. We met it a couple weeks ago. Thank you so much for everybody who uh, pledged. It's still going on. In fact, we have a stretch goal. If we get to $1,500, then Tony and I will do a full bonus episode, a spoiler review of our time with Pandemic Legacy. Both he and I played two totally separate games, so you can hear both of our stories and what it was like as we experienced it with our family and our friends. So if we hit the $1,500 mark, then we will do that special episode. And also, I'd like to think something else would be kind of cool. Yes, we met our goal, but I would love it if we could possibly get to 100 contributors. Right now, we're right around 50. With Pod Pledge, it's a really cool site in that you had the option to uh, just give a one-time contribution. So if you want to, just give a buck, but that counts as a contributor. So it'd be really great if we could get 100 So if you wouldn't mind, maybe just pledge $1 and we get to 100 And uh, Tony and I maybe can come up with something special. If we hit the 100 we'll do something special for that too. I sure we will. And a dollar, guys, think about it. That's only one-third of a 20-ounce Coke in the hotel I'm at right now. <laughs> that's right. You were at, uh, where are you? You're in Tampa. That's right. You said uh, that yeah, earlier, right? I'm at Tampa. So, you know, think of it. It's just a dollar. One time. What does that mean? Yeah, pay me a dollar. I'll even give you one minute of silence. But pandemic, let's see. I've only got one more month left to play, and the game will be history for me. And, you know, Marty, I've got kind of a, a happy, sad thing going on there. How so? How I can understand sad because it's over, but why happy? Because it's over. Because, I, you know, now I can move on to something else. We can get something else off the shelf. You know, I'm kind of excited for that reason alone. And it also means that, hey, season two is around the corner and I can start it when it possibly shows up. But I'll be ready for Seafall and things like that. So happy in knowing that I played a game for 12 plus times. I've definitely gotten my money out of it. And 
sad that it is ending and I'll have to go back to regular pandemic, but that's okay. The next show is our big movie episode, Box Office, Red Box or Trash Box. We're going to have Chris Kirkman and Dan Patrice on. And once again, we're going to be going through the big summer movies of 2016 where we're going to rank each of them. And we're actually going to do our draft again, just like we did last year. And maybe I will do a tad better than what I did last year because it was pretty pathetic for me. It was abysmal. Dude, it was like being releasing a horror flick in the middle of summer, which you picked. Which I did, which was an idiot pick. But anyway, so anyway, that's going to be coming up our next episode. We're looking uh, forward to that. And then right on the tail of that, we're actually going to be heading out to the Cool Men You're Not Expo. Uh, We're one of the special guests that are going to be there. Would love for you if you can come down or come over, come up. Somehow get over there, say hey to us. Uh, It's a very laid back show. There's going to be a lot of new games uh, coming. In fact, I got a link today of a lot of the games that they're going to be showing with some of the rules and everything. So uh, they got a lot of stuff coming out this year. They've got the uh, brand new Kickstarter going on right now for Rum and Bones. Uh, That's like the second edition. And I have backed that one because I really enjoyed Rum and Bones. I like what they're doing with this one. So Hopefully you guys can come out and uh, spend some time with us. It'd be great to see you. Yeah, I would love it if they could. And by the way, Marty, one thing about that um, movie show, it's going to be long. People, I'll warn you now, it's going to be long. So there may be a special Easter egg hidden in the show to make you have to listen to it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, look at look at our two guests. Of course, it's going to tend to go long. We gotta we gotta pull those guys in. That's why we're trying to limit the movies to only like twenty or twenty five. Right now, uh, and, and in final thoughts, just for me is, you know, Marty received fifty first state from Portal Games, and he had a very special note from Ignacy about making sure that he shared it with the other guy, me. Well, our Marty obviously did not pay attention to that very well because he has been sharing it with every other guy and not me, but that's okay. I understand. I've been out of town. Uh, It's okay. That's correct. You have been out of town. As soon as your butt gets back into Charlotte, uh, we're going to get this game to the table because you really need to play. I know I do. So either way, I am really looking forward to it just so I can keep rolling dice and taking names. Thanks for listening to RDTN. Follow us on Twitter at Dyson Names. Visit our website, RollDiceTakeNames.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Roll Dice Take Names. Visit our BGG Guild. Like us on Facebook. How many hits with the two reviews do you think this episode will receive? Unfortunately, not enough to kill it. So if West of Africa sounded interesting to you, remember you can go pre-order that at funagaingames.com along with other interesting titles such as Food Chain Magnate and Arkwright. So again, go check them out at funagaingames.com. All right, I got to run to the restroom. I'll be right back. If you want to cut fun again, that's fine.